Hello, everybody, everybody, man. You got Anthony Brogdon on Strong Inspirations, my friends, and I'm coming at you straight no chaser. Let me tell you what I'm doing. How about this? I'm good at this. I'm getting good at this. And I got a guy on the channel, man. This is a, a he a personal friend of mine, and he an expert. He know what he talking about. He is good. And, and I was sitting with him the other day, I'd say about a week ago. I smoke cigars every now and then with some fellas, right? And we sit back and he was there. And I'm thinking of this guy, I said, man, this guy is an expert. He was saying some expert stuff while we were smoking cigars. I say, man, I got to have him on the channel. And then <laughs> it's so appropriate to have him on the channel right now because of what he's going to talk about and what started over there in Tokyo. I'm leading into it. I ain't telling you what it is just yet. What happened in Tokyo, uh, I think it was like a last week or something like that. You know what it is, them circles, them colored circle thing that, that, that you know what I'm telling you about my friends. I am, I'm just hinting to you. And <laughs> strong inspirations where we give it to you straight, no chasing. I find these people and I let them do the talking. Hey, you know, you know, hold on. You know, I do do some talking and I do ask a couple questions, but outside of that, I let them give it to you. And so I appreciate you, my guests. Oh man, hold on. One more thing. Last night, 50 people subscribed. It was like 40, 40, no, it was 52 new subscribers last night. This thing is growing. Y'all hitting that button. I appreciate it. And to you who haven't hit it and you've been watching me, because I got a message from a guy said, man, you keep it coming. I'm going to get um, hit the subscribe button. It's free. You don't get no information. You just hit the button and you're a part of the family even more. Hit the like button on this video because you're going to like what this guy got to say. Man, he been doing his thing for a long time. He is good at it. He know what he's talking about. So hit the like button on this. I want you to hit that notifications bell because like you say, you get a ding and when I be putting up them new videos and I, I just released one 10 minutes ago prior to, you know, me going on with this guest. I just released one. It's called the 8th of August. You need to watch that. And then tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself, my friends. Tell somebody. Share this. Let it go around and around. All right, I really would appreciate it. The other thing I want you to do, my friends, is watch my movies. I'm a filmmaker. I'm serious about this black history stuff. And it's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Slaves who went to college, slaves who owned businesses, slaves who bought their freedom. And I go up to 1960. And one of the things that uh, is in here uh, from a similar perspective than what we're talking about is a guy by the name of Ruby Foster, who was one of the co-founders of the National Negro Baseball League. It's in here. We talk about it. Just to give you a hint, you need to watch this. It's good. 75 powerful, powerful minutes. This stuff is going to blow your mind. All right? And it's streaming on Amazon. Just go type in Business in the Black and it pops up on Amazon. And then the other thing that I've done, my friends, and like I told you, I'm serious. As I wrote this book, it's called Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts. And Ruby Foster is also in my book, but there's more. Thorough. One guy wrote me, no, it was a lady. She wrote me a message, said she thought that it's the most comprehensive, easy to read Black history book she's ever ran across. And she's ordered at least 15 copies. And every 10th copy that I sell, I donate one to the school. The kids need to know this. Make you feel better when you know how great your people were and are. And that's what this book does. It. Uh, it's called Black Business Book. I want you to get you a copy. You get a copy, I autograph it. So then that might mean something. I'm telling you, watch. It's coming down. Things, good things are happening. So get you a copy of my book. Go to my website, businessintheblack.net. Go to there. Just cut the Amazon man out. Go to businessintheblack.net. 
order the book. I ship it out the same day. I make sure you get it because I got copies. I wrote it. I know it's in it. I want you to know. So I really appreciate that. Um, man, I'm so excited. My man, come on. Uh, that I don't know what to do, and he's taking time out of his busy schedule. So come on, my brother, introduce yourself. Let's get it on strong inspiration. <laughs> Where do you want me to go, man? You know, where do well, I start? What's your name? What's your name? Uh, Everybody knows. Uh, Leland Stein. I'm the third. Yeah, I'm the son of a football coach, uh, Leland Stein Jr. He uh, was a founding father of St. Cecilia, four great men, uh, Sam Washington, Ron Thompson, Leland Stein, and Jocko Hughes left the West Side Cubs yeah. and started St. Cecilia many, many years ago in about 69, I do believe. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like so that's, that's where I come from. Um, now, hold on, let me stop you. Now, everybody, he's a Detroiter, so if you're not in Detroit, you don't know that that's one of our most famous uh, uh, Little League football teams. Uh, that I mean, they produced, produced uh, a ton of NFL stars. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, Leland, you, 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 your background, you was a, a sports writer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I played sports at McKenzie, and even at Michigan State, I played a little bit freshman team football, and uh, coached basketball for many, many years so with Magic and and Kareem in LA. I lived in LA twenty eight years, and so that's oh, when I no, started. I didn't know like, this. You did what with them? Yeah. Uh, coach basketball. Yeah. I, I played at McKenzie. I was a basketball player. I played at St. Cecilia. Football was my sport, though. You know, and, I just but then you coached. <laughs> what, do you, what, what do you mean you coached with? with, with well, I coached guys? at the basketball camps. Magic's basketball camps, Kareem's, Norm Nixon's. Did that for about 13 years. Oh. And, uh, I, I played in the frat games out in uh, L.A. And uh, my man, Walt Hazard, the great you know, UCLA great uh, yeah. champion, uh, Laker. He uh, was our coach and he had a stroke and I took over coaching that team and that kind of got me going. Oh Walt man, really that's liked huge. Me. So he, he took he took Timmy. He liked a little short five nine guy that was fast and quick. Oh, I see. <laughs> and played defense. Yeah. So yeah, so that's, that's my background. And then my dad passed and I came back to Detroit and took over the Michigan Chronicle because I was working for the LA Sentinel in the Black Voice News in Los Angeles. And while out there, those things elevated me to covering the Super Bowls. I've covered like 29 consecutive Super Bowls. You got a particular style that you developed as a writer? Yeah, well, initially I was doing features and, and working for the Black press started out with the Black Voice News. We were able to tell the truth. <laughs> okay, I, I love could, it. I could tell the story as I saw it, and I didn't have any editors beating the heck out of me. Now, I always thought it was a disadvantage working for the black press at first because the, the, the white press, they were daily, so they had more access, so to speak, and, and, and those kind of things. And, uh, you know, it, it, I wanted to compete. Uh, and, and, and I was an engineer at first. I went back to school to become a writer and a teacher, but that's a whole nother story. But yeah. Uh, uh, what, what happened was because it was bigger than I thought because people was reading it, that even though we wasn't the LA Times, all the black people around were reading and following, especially in LA, all the movie stars and athletes and people were following and I was getting a bigger follow than even I knew. And so uh, a miracle happened. I got a call from uh, John Thompson. I had wrote a story about the NCAA and it was called, it's time to do the right thing or something like that. Uh -huh. And I, I was in grad school getting a teaching credential and I was transitioning from engineering to journalism. And I wrote this story merging my education knowledge with the things I knew as an athlete. And I wrote this story and lo and behold, this is what black papers do. They share, there's 200, 50 something black papers around the country. Sure. They have a, we have our own press uh, associated press called the yeah, NNPA. Like Newswire. Yeah, it's the National Newspaper Public yeah. Association, which I didn't know about all that at the time, but this big thing opened up for me. And so my paper, The Black Voice, at the time, I wasn't with the LA Sentinel yet. They sent their paper to Dr. Bogle, who was the, the Philadelphia, I think it's the Philadelphia Inquirer, it's the black paper in Philly. Yeah. And he, 
out of hundred papers, he picks out the black voice news and he picks Leland Stein's story out of it. It was about the NCA. So Cheney, who was my frat brother, happened to be his best friend. He he faxed that article, sent it to Cheney because he knew Cheney and Thompson was trying to do something with the NCA because this was back in about 90, 1992. And uh, Cheney sent it to Thompson. The two of them got on a conference call, found me in LA, called me at the Black Voice and invited me to come to Chicago. They had started something which was called the BCA, the Black Coaches Association. Okay. And it was the ground roots. It was just formulating because they was trying to challenge the NCA because they was implementing a thing called Prop 48, which meant if you didn't pass the test 18 or more on the SAT, or it was 100 or something on the okay. SAT, then you couldn't qualify for athletics at the college level. I got you. Now, sure enough, we knew that the test should be used as a guide and a gauge, which they acknowledged, but not as an absolute. Because what Thompson and Cheney always had to do, because they couldn't compete with the North Carolinas and the Michigans and the UCLA's to get players, they they took other players. They took a chance on a guy with a 2.8 or 2.9 and brought him to Georgetown and Temple. And then they mentored them. They did, unlike my, my white schools, my brothers, they give you a tutor, but they don't, they're not Thompson and Cheney. I got they, they coaches don't give your face and treat you like your father, your brother, your sister, your uncle. I got you. I love it. That's how they did things. Yeah. And they were able to hug the guys when they needed. They some things just black folk just know about other black folk. Yes, yes. And and and, and they knew that. And they knew they was gonna take an opportunity, they was gonna eliminate the opportunity to mentor some men. Yeah. So the question then was about exclusion versus inclusion. I got you. And they was fighting. Conversely, at the same time, for more black coaches, there was only about three then, and assistant coach couldn't have been no more than three or four of them. I mean, five or ten yeah. at the most. So, so you and, show up in Chicago. I show up. I'm the only writer. They invited the only writer. So there's Thompson Cheney, Vivian Stringer, uh, Nolan Richardson, George Ravlin, uh, Man, uh, Marion Washington, uh, uh, Perry Watson. Uh, just at the litany at that time of the coaches uh, that were participating at that time. And, he, and they told me, look, you have a free reign just to write and talk with anybody. It was a two day event. And they just let me sit there and just talk to everybody at any way I wanted to. And I wrote this story in their voice and it was published throughout the NNPA. And when I got back to LA, all the cat at the Associated Press, they was stop, man. We saw this article. You wrote. tell what's going on? Are they gonna boycott? What are they doing? What is the B said? What are the black coaches up to? Uh, are they planning on doing something? They asking me, right? Yeah, and, you know, trying to get me to tell. Man, I, I said, no, no, no. I said, what y'all probably need to do is call them and just read the story and, and let their voices speak. And this is an opportunity for y'all to not talk up the discourse. Y'all can understand the kind of concerns they was having now. Yeah, sure. So now you go talk to them about it. And that's why I played it. You know, I didn't try to jump out there and put myself. No, no, Cause no. back then us writers, we weren't always trying to jump in front of the camera, man. I understand. You know, write the story, let it speak, let them talk and I'll get the hell out of the way. Yes. All oh, that's done changed now, but I'm too old. I done lost yeah, yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah, 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 that's another story. But, uh, but I did my thing, but after that, then when I got back, Ravlin was at SC at the time. And he was like, well, how come you're not coming to USC? I'm like, hell, they won't let me in. <laughs> he said, what? We got like 30 kids for my on this team. You've been covering them for the last two, three years. Yeah. Go so sit down, we're gonna write Dr. Bogle. I mean, Dr. Steven Sample was the president of USC at the time. And he said, Mike Garrett was the athletic director. Here they are, we got a black athletic, a black coach, and the black paper can't get in. To USC because the white boys run the press stuff. I got you. Right? So they was like, well, we got black writers. Why we got to let you show me some clips? Well, how am I going to show clips when I ain't got in the damn thing, right? Yeah. So I was stuck in a no man's land because they kept feeding me the, the clip lip and can't get no clips if you don't write. But I wrote this story and it went national. And then uh, Thompson and Cheney was, look, we're going to help you. Use that. And we're going to stand with you. So Ravlin, let me uh, CC him. 
send it to uh, 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 um, Mike Garrett and Dr. Uh, Sample. They wrote me back, Mr. Stein, uh, don't worry, you'll have no problems. Uh, keep uplifting our kids. That was it. Because that's Man, what we I were doing. It. They were our kids. And you tell me I can't cover them nothing in college, but I was covering them in high school. Yeah. But anyway, so I got in, but of course he wouldn't give me no photos, no parking. I mean, it's a long story about all that. Oh the, my the God, racism, racism, something else. Yeah, it's a something of gun. But of course I beat him down because I got in there and I was busting my butt, right? Man, I wasn't I love playing. It. Wasn't let, happy let, to let, be let, there. Me, let me divert into this. Now you, okay. you've become, because you've been writing so long, you also are a, a, a sports historian. To a degree, yeah, probably. That's not now the one same, thing that, same. that you and I talked about that yeah. that, that we you know that we want to talk about on uh, today is blacks in the Olympics. Oh my god, love it. Come on, brother Stein, sh share some of your thoughts in that regard. Well, um the blacks in the Olympics has been historic. I mean, if you want to know like history, history, uh, you could go back to like let, let me just drop something on you real real quick yeah. here, like a real history lesson. You could go all the way back to two guys named John Baxter Taylor and George Pope. George is the first to medal representing the U.S. George, what's the last, last name? Yeah, George uh, Polk. He's the first to medal. Right. But Taylor- Representing the U.S. But Taylor, Taylor was, was first in to it get before gold. him. No, he was second. He came along and let's see, Taylor ran in the 1908 London Games. And he became the first African-American gold medalist representing the United States when he ran the third leg of the four by four, four by 400 relay. So that's the two. And Taylor was born to former slaves and it's an amazing story, his story, but you know, he did it. He went out there and he did it. So tragically for Taylor, you know, he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree of veterinarian, but he died soon after because he caught <coughs> a typhoid fever. <laughs> okay. So we didn't really get to see what he was able to become. So, you know, that that's that's one of the things. So that probably happened. prior to that, there was a, a, like an unofficial law in the United States that they wouldn't let blacks be in the Olympics. Well, you know, the Olympics, always going back to then 1904 then 1908 then after that we started getting inclusion as you could qualify the olympics has always even in the face of america's racism has almost always been about uh if you could qualify you can compete the history of african americans in the olympics have been long the racism that african americans have experienced in the, in the Olympics has come from the United States, not so much from the Olympics. I'll give you an example. Uh -huh. When Jesse Owens won in 36, Avery Brundage, the most racist American in the world, was the head of the United States Olympic Committee at the time. So he said, if you do not come home, come and run on the circuit, because then they would have to go run to Amsterdam, run in uh, Switzerland, you know, all these big stakes, because Europe loved track and field, and they got all the money. They didn't pay the athletes. Well, Jesse knew that. He, his wife had just had a baby. He wanted to go home. <laughs> Jesse said, I'm going home, man. I, I can't run right now. I got to see my family attend to my business. He said, you will never run again. And they expelled him from the United States. He never ran again. Jesse never ran. Hold right on. Now you got again. some story there. Jesse, he ran in the Olympics. Yes, 1936. Won the gold medal. Walk out of the stadium. Yes, he did. Never ran again, ever. After Didn't the run. Olympics. Yeah, because uh, uh, Brundage kind of kicked him off the U.S. team. Th that's what happened to Owens. So then Owens almost got ostracized from the Olympics till sixty-eight games, when um, uh, uh, Tommy Smith and. Um, my John brother Carlos. just died. Lee Evans. No, not Carlos gets a lot of credit for stuff. He deserves credit for going to the stadium and doing it. But the prelude to it was a two-year building program where they was thinking and, and trying to galvanize people. And they were in Oakland in that area with the Panthers and others. And they were being more militant. And they were thinking about the world more deeply. That was a Lee Evans and Tommy Smith. And they came up with a thing called a project 
for Olympic rights, the, the project for human rights. That's what it was called. Now I've been blessed to interview Tommy and Evans on a number of occasions. And they've sat down with me. I mean, I've been in trouble because I've worked for the black press. Just real quick back to town. I went to 30 some Final Fours consecutively. And of course, me and Thompson became good friends because he came every year and I saw him every year. And, and we ate, had bread, did all kinds of things together, met every year and, and quiet meetings. We used to have me. But I asked him, I said, why did y'all call me? He said, because you was working for the black press. <laughs> I had power I didn't even know I had. Mm. And that's why they chose me and not Bill Rose, my good friend with the New York Times, or back then, or Michael Wilburn, my good friend, was with the Washington Post. He didn't call them. Of course, they knew them and they called them trying to get, but when it came to this issue, something they were trying to get their voice out there, they picked me. Now, but back to the Olympics. Yeah. When, when, when uh, Owen showed up, he got home in 68. The Project for Human Rights is what Tommy and them called. It hurt him dearly that it was labeled a black power salute and a black power initiative when he really didn't have anything against none of that. I mean, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was a project for human rights. That's how deeply Tommy and them felt about it. He felt that the things that were happening in America was a human rights issue. See, people don't want to give him credit for being a deep thinker. He is Dr. Tommy Smith now. He, he was a professor and he's done a lot of things, but that's what they were thinking. They wanted to boycott the games, but when they got with Harry Edwards and others, and, and, and then that's when they finally brought Owens back to the Olympic family to talk to the brothers. <laughs> so he brought him in there with Spencer to tell you about all them sitting there. And he was said, well, it'd be better. So to that aim, Owens was kind of right. Okay. Just going out there and compete. Now, now, let me go back to this. Now, so 1904, there's one black guy in the Olympics. And the Olympics was in St. Louis. I don't know that. I said the first black to medal representing the U.S. Okay. So I, I don't know precisely if there were other black people on the team. Yeah, I got you. And history and the records haven't been totally clear. You know, if you go back and look, I'm sure you can find it, but I haven't delved that deeply. Now, let's, now you know some other names uh, that was before uh, Jesse Owens? Yeah, well, um, let's see. Um, let's see if we can get before Jesse. I think Jesse and that whole group, there was quite a few brothers on that team. Uh, so by 36, it had the doors had been blown open to the Olympics. Uh, 32, you have to look, because it was a lot going on. They had the, uh, the Depression and the World Recession, and they had come out World War I. I'm sure the Olympics didn't kind of got shut down right along in there. Oh, really? Okay, I'm pretty sure. Cause they did, they got shot down after 36. Cause they didn't have the 40 games. Oh, they didn't? No, no. There was no 1940 games. There might not have been no 44 games. If I'm correct, I could be wrong. But 48 might've been the first time back. But we could look that up. To, yeah, yeah, to make yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But I don't want to lie. Cause I have it. It's not yeah, on yeah, no, top I'm, of my head. Right. So I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's kind of true. The history of the Olympics is that we have a plethora of amazing black women competing. One in particular, I wish Gabby was there because, she, I mean, I wish um, uh, Richardson was there, but because she's not, I don't, do not penalize Miss Richardson. <coughs> Gabby Thomas is amazing. She's a 200 meter runner with the Harvard, graduated in neuroscience, getting her master's studying the racial disparities in health is what she's studying now in her master's she's going to do a phd and she got a chance to win a gold medal in 200. no i'm sorry about richardson but we can't I be boycotting because of that girl we got a uh, simone manual led the team to a bronze when we weren't supposed to get no medal in the swimming we got a volleyball. She's the best. Obiga, Oboga, Abajuki. <laughs> you know, she's the best in the world representing the U.S. in volleyball. Uh, we got the uh, Goldie in field hockey. Ashley Johnson. They got these, these are black gold. women in field Man, hockey. Yeah, she's the Goldie. Got the most important position. Uh, it's just on and on. So, yeah, this is a bunch of amazing stories. We got 
uh, uh, ladies in soccer, Crystal Dunn. I mean, there's more. You know, I could keep naming yeah, them. Yeah, I didn't but, know. Them but they're out there. And so we should honor them. Let me let me go and back to this. Now, name uh some other names that you know maybe we might not know. Uh is there you know in their 50s Olympics and that yeah, kind of okay. thing? Okay, well, here's one of my best ones. When, when when she talked about the Olympics being racist, I'm just like, oh my god, against black women. Back in 1948, Alex Coachman became the first black woman to win a gold medal in a long jump. And she started the Alex Coachman Foundation, the Alex Coachman Track Club, way back in 48. You know, where black women, when black people couldn't drink from the same water fountain, when you couldn't sit in the back of the bus, when you, you couldn't live in the same neighborhood, you couldn't go to the University of Alabama. I, I mean, you. it's just on and on and on. Now, you where know. was she from? Oh God, I, that's a great one. I can't name your city. Yeah, can't give it to you. But she won the long jump, high jump, high jump. Yes, Alice Coachman. Has, it, has there ever been anybody uh, that won uh, pole vaulting or anything no like black that? Women. No. Has there okay. ever been a black the medal in the Winter Olympics? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, well, I got the one right here. Uh, this is a great story, Lauren. Lauren uh, uh, Williams, good friend. I know her real well. Her, her family, she's from Detroit. Lauren Williams, uh, she was a, a sprinter. She uh, won a gold medal in the 4x100 in London. And again, I, I'm bragging. I got to say it because I did it. I covered the 2012 I, games. I got you. I love it. Day the month. And we, of course, I did a story on her there, interviewed her there for the Michigan Chronicle because I was I sought her down because I knew she was a Detroit girl. Her mama and all them was there. It was a great story, great time. But anyway, Lauren Williams, uh, in 2012, she got a silver in the 100 in Athens 2004. And, uh, but she went over to the bobsled and she won uh, the silver in the two-woman bobsled in 2014 in the social games. She sure yeah. did. And she became one of five athletes to have won both a summer and a winter winter Olympic medal. And she was the first woman to do it. Lauren Williams, the mm. first woman. So now she's the first black woman, she's the first woman to medal in the summer and the winter Olympics. Dang, now, uh, the, the, the track star, the hurdler, who would have won a gold, but she fell at the, the second to the last hurdle. She tripped and fell and lost. I can't think of her name now. Really cute young black woman from LSU. She went over and did the bobsled as well, but she didn't win a medal in the summer game because she failed. But she was the, the, the odds on favorite to win the, the hurdles, the 100 hurdles. Can't get a name Man. off the top of my head, but I can look that, it up. It, it, let me ask you this. Uh, when, as, as, as you may know, was there, uh, even back in those days, like with Jesse Owens, let's say, for example, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, did he have to face stuff like he couldn't sleep in the uh, uh, with the rest of the white yes. athletes and all that kind of stuff? It, that's a good question. Uh, they won't tell us, and I never asked Jesse before he passed. Um, it was my intention that, yes, that the black athletes slept separately. That was just a foregone conclusion. I mean, you're talking 36. Look, when the brothers went to war with her in the 30s, they, 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 they my granddad has all black, a uh, true. Yeah. He, he, he was on the red brigade, which he hated, you know, because they had to do all the cleanup. They come by, they stayed two miles behind. There's the logistics wing and they had the, the oil and the bullets. <laughs> they was walking around the Germans trying to find and blow their butt up. They blow all that stuff up. So, but then they clean up the dead and, and have to bring the, Stuff forward. I got you. Grandpa did that. So yeah, that's how it was, man. Let, let's let's talk about this now. The uh, the John Carlos yeah. and, and 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 them raising the arm and the Black Power symbol. Well, what, see, I what, what's the, John? Set the scene on that one for us? Would you please? Okay. Well, after they all agreed to uh, go forward and compete, except for Kareem had already made his decision, and then West Unso. And uh, Elvin Hayes stepped out for other reasons. And uh, I think Dan Issel had an injury and Spencer made the team. But I just had to throw that out there. That's how Spencer got on the team. But uh, they sat there and they said, okay, we're gonna come up with some ideas. And they made a button called a Project for Human Rights. 
and they passed it out to even other athletes and so when they went to they gave it to uh, the white athlete the, from Australia that finished with the silver I think his name Clark who ended up being good friends with uh, Tommy and them for like that matter of fact when, when they, uh, they, he, he passed they went to his funeral they was pallbearers but the button was a project for human rights the beads meant unity the of the, the the thing meant unity for all people. It wasn't black power. No, each thing had a, a fundamental saying. I can't recall each yeah, one at this you. moment, but John told it to me and I've written it. And it's somewhere, but each the beads, the, the black socks, the the barrette, some of them wore the barrette, the black glove and the fist up there, each one had a symbolic meaning in relation to the project for human rights. You got to keep saying that word because that's what John Lee Evans just passed about four months ago, three months ago. A dear friend ran the 400. He went up there with the beret and he put the hand up afterwards, you know. The so, great now, hold on, let, me, let me ask you. So, so yeah. those two athletes, were they gold and silver medal or what were they? Gold and bronze. Gold and bronze. And what race was it? The 100. Okay. So now, and what Olympics was that? No, it was the two. Because Jimmy Hines won the 100. Yeah, it was the two. Okay, so what, what Olympic, what year was that? 1968. So 68 Olympics, they win the gold and the bronze. They get up on stage. Well, they had talked about it. They said, we're going to raise fists. And so that's why they sequenced it. Uh, Tommy raised the right and John raised the left. So they could have it, you know, it was in between. You know, it was kind of. They I got all, you. Uh, and they covered the spectrum of the whole podium, you I know, by you. doing that. And they had the buttons on, and uh, the the silver medalists put the button on. So and now, then, what happened to them for doing it? Did they strip their medals away? They can't strip the medals, but they got every bunch just kicked them out. And when 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 Tommy came home, he couldn't get a job. He was ostracized, and he had hit rock bottom for a minute. He did both of them actually. They couldn't run anymore on the international circuit. So it was taken from them, track and field, just like they did Jesse. And Tommy found his solace in school and went back to school and ended up getting his master's and got ended up getting his doctor's and he ended up teaching and coaching at Occidental College for a number of years in LA. How, 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 much, how much newsworthy did that move make internationally and was there backlash against the, the the penalties that they faced oh my god no because unfortunately we didn't have cable we didn't have this this is where the plethora of media you like you've yeah, been in yeah, your blog right, right, none of that right. stuff existed right so the only voice to be heard or told was through the three channels, news channels, and, and, and maybe they and, didn't tell it. And the, and the white press. Now, the black press was out there, but of course, we weren't at the games at that time. I covered for the black press. I was the first one to be credentialed representing the NNPA. That was in 1996. You know, and I had to write the stories for all black America, which you went through on the wire, oh, things like my that. God, but that's huge. Yeah, but yeah, that's what happened. But when they came home, they didn't really have a voice. Now, local papers like in Oakland and the black paper, the LA Sentinel, the Black Forest News, in our communities, we were trying to help them. Yeah. But back then, we didn't have no inclusion at the table, not only not politically, not in the, yeah, in the Justice Department, not in the colleges. It, it, we just didn't have no power yeah, to I exercise. Let, let, let me ask you this. What what is there an Olympian, a uh, black Olympian that you might say has won the most medals? Yeah, uh Carl Lewis. There you go. I remember that name. He's the greatest track and field athlete ever. And, and in many eyes, the greatest Olympian ever, even though Michael Phelps in swimming, what he did cannot be minimized. You cannot sit here and say what he did wasn't awesome. But well, how many, how many medals Carl Lewis? And, and, and what did with more than one game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first, he would have got started in 19, oh Lord, let's see, 1980. Right. But but the, the, at that time, we didn't have the, the journalism out there to, to help them guys 
to the level they needed help to write the ship, to tell their story. Because they thought black, you know, they created like John, Tommy and, and John Carlos, they thought they was like Fred Hampton or somebody supposed to be scared of or, or yeah. Huey Newton. You know, yeah. they were ready to kill them yeah. brothers, you know? Right. They was getting death threats and all kind of stuff. Yeah, but that, So yeah, it was yeah. really hard on them at, at the time. But let, let me just tell you this beautiful story. At the 2012 games, uh, at every Olympics, the big countries rent a beautiful facility, a banquet house, like a beautiful place that can cook and there's food and you can sit around. It's just beautiful sitting area. It, it's called this. The USA House was in this amazing place in London. The only people that can go in the, UA, the USA House is past Olympians. If you were a past Olympian, you're welcome to come in. And you can stay there all day and they got the films and during, during the course of the whole day the olympians that finish the the particular event they come and they get honored like the whole soccer team came the women's yeah, soccer team came when we was in there um and then just olympians just came but i'm sitting in there i get in because wendy hillier helped me get in i'm sitting up in there like wow what have i got myself into you know because they ain't that you into because you're a writer but you know, people like me, and I was with the black press, and they just bonded with me. And I get in there, here come Tommy Smith. He come in, he get a standing ovation. He come who? Tommy Smith. Okay. Now I had interviewed him a number of times, but here he comes. It was like, and everybody was standing and clapping. Whoever was in there. And I was like, wow. Then Tommy picked my table and come sit over there with me. And then next thing we know, uh, Dick Fosbury came and sat next to us, then Pinder. And I'm sitting at this table with all these Olympians, right? I mean, you know, Dick Fosbury invented the backwards jump. That's what right. he called yep. the Fosbury yep. flop. Yep. But we just, I just got, I was like in heaven. This is where it's hard being a journalist because I wanted to just jump into fandom. But of course I didn't do that because I know better. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. me and Tommy sat there and talked and he was like, Leland, man, I saw that story. Because one of the stories I did with him went into a book it was called 100, the celebration of African Americans in the Centennial Olympics. The 100th Olympics was 1996. And we did a book out of LA, uh, Johnny Cochran and all them helped fund it. And they picked four black writers. I was one of them to go out and interview everybody. I had to interview uh, George Foreman, Tommy Smith, Sugar Ray Lynn, and Carl Lewis. Those were the four they gave me. So they sent me out there to go get them. <laughs> And I did that and did it and then went in the book and we had a big grand opening in Hollywood Hills and it was just Ooh. awesome. They had the book there and all the Olympians were there. So Tommy, I saw him from all that, but then he came there and he sat with me and he was saying, I appreciate the way you wrote that. Cause I, it, I was like one of the first, I was able to say what he wanted to say, a project for human rights and tell all the story the way he wanted it told. No chasers, no white people, no militancy. I got you. He want people to know it was a human thing because that, that hurt him. That touched him about the human aspect of what they were trying to accomplish. So yeah, him, him and Carlos went up there, put the fists up, got kicked out. So none of the athletes put the fists doing it. Well, Evans did afterwards. He did it right after. And he had the black uh, uh, beret on. So, you know, Evans had the black socks. He did the whole thing too. But those guys, man, I, I, I love them. Yeah, you know, it's just an honor to have, have been sitting down with them and for yeah. them to invite me into their country. We, you know how long we sat there? About three hours. So has there ever been a Black in America Olympic uh, administration? You know what I mean? For the yeah, there, there has been. <laughs> I got to say this, man. He's my mentor. Dr. Leroy Walker. Got to look him up. A legend. He was the president of North Carolina a &T. He was the first black Olympic track and field coach. I think that probably was the 92 games or maybe the 88, somewhere along in there. But okay. Dr. Leroy Walker became the first black president of the United States Olympic Committee in 1996. You know what that brother did? He went there to the USOC. He looked around at this amazing organization. It was all white. 
and all men. And so instead of going begging to them, he used his academia. He wrote a business plan, got it funded through the, uh, the Brit something foundation. He went to them with $200,000 in hand and said, I have a program called Project Goal, and I, we're going to go out and get 50 minorities, women, Native Americans, uh, Black men and women, uh, Hispanic men and women. We're going to find 50, and we're going to bring them to Colorado Springs for three weeks, and we're going to teach them about the Olympic movement. Now, what that meant was that the USOC is the United States Olympic Committee. Right. They do the overall, they answer to the IOC, the International Olympic Committee. So it's one arm get to talk to this international committee. Right. So all the teams have to get funneled through the USOC. But each sport has its own governing body. It's USA you. Basketball, USA Gymnastics, USA Track and Field, USA Wrestling. So you get it. So each one of these organizations, they call nationally governed bodies, they all have a wing, a arm, PR, personnel, marketing, you. training, facilities, where people are working. No black folk. <laughs> 96. So Walker brought us all in there. Now, some of us had been track star. I was the only writer in the house. Everybody else had been either Olympians or they was yeah, like yeah. Uh, working as athletic directors or former yeah. coach or something like that, right? Yeah. In a sport. So by going there, like one of them had done tennis. It was a, 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 a Hispanic lady who was a tennis star. So she there, she wanted to try to get on the USA tennis. So each person had an ideal of where they could fit. I you got know. you. I got you. I stayed with the United States Olympic Committee. I got you. They created a, a committee that they put me on. It was called the Minority and Sports Task Force. I got you. And they had 10 of us. So I was on the United States Olympic Committee which I'm still on, but every, so they taught us the underworkings and they exposed us to all those NGBs were there. I you had the head of USA it. track and field, USA basketball. Yeah. So they had to meet all of us. Yeah. Now, Leroy Walker did that. He crossed the raging rivers, reached the hand of fellowship back and pull others up. I love you it. Go back into the USOC, but oh, we need to help black folk. He, Wrote a business plan, got funded, 200 grand, made them match the 200 grand, flew us all in there, put us all up in the, bro the Broadmoor. The Broadmoor is one of the greatest hotels in the country in Colorado Springs. And we sat there and learned it. And he funded you. it and he went to them. In a, in a, so he was the first black president of the United States Olympic Committee. And that's what he did. He called a thing called Project Gold. I love it. Hey, everybody, this is what we do with Strong Inspirations. I got them guys and they be talking. <laughs> I just sit back and try to come up with a question. I'm oh, sorry. I, I know, you got man, me going. I'll man, never get to talk you, about you, this. You, you, Nobody you, believe it I, if I told them. Whoever tells. I never get to tell anybody this stuff. You point, my brother. <laughs> everybody, if you don't hit the like button on this channel, I don't know what will get you to like a video on Strong Inspirations. <laughs> but I'm keeping coming at you. I'm keep coming at you with these people that I find. And I found him sitting next to me at the cigar bar smoking. I know him before that, but that's where it hit. Everybody, come on now, hit the subscribe button to uh to, to strong inspirations, hit the like button on this video. Because I, I I tell you, he ain't he ain't finished. He want to keep going, but I gotta stop somewhere. And we get to the main point. And and, and hit the notification bell. Tell somebody about strong inspirations. Follow this young man here as he continues to write. And to you, my brother, I say with all sincerity, I'm so happy that you came on the channel and you shared this knowledge with us. Thanks, I'm brother. so happy that I want to say this to you. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I love what you're doing, writing them articles in the right way, telling it the way it should be told from all perspectives, but in particular, from the perspective of us, African-American, Black people, those who don't get it told the way we should tell it, all right? 
keep doing that. I love it. Everybody, I got to say goodbye. Bye. We out until we come back at you again on Strong Inspirations. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day, everybody. Peace. Peace.